else. I have to remember my posture. As I'm hunched over <laughs> like Quasimodo. Well, that's why my chair is a, a skosh higher. When I was trying to, I was going to try to grab somebody to do like a height check. I know that you're, you're super tall, mm. you know, because I'm like 4'9". Oh, come on. Huh? Yeah. Uh, I, but I do like to say I'm taller on the radio. <laughs> Chello, I'm Kathy with a K, radio broadcaster in Honolulu. Hawaii POV is a talk story series, radio, music, Hawaii. This is Rick Hamada. We work in the same offices, in the same halls here at in Ivole. Uh, we are currently in February 2020. Mm -hmm. And Rick Hamada, he's been very gracious to just uh, indulge me in various topics of politics and life and all those kinds of things so thank you so much it is a pleasure as my 17 year old daughter would say Aww. this is dope so you're a dad i am a dad and proud dad zoe actually will be 17 soon mm -hmm. so currently 16. zachary is 19 mm -hmm. and he's a freshman in college oh fun believe it or not is he loving it he is because it's a dramatic different whole different vibe he's he's a great student what drives him is music and now he's in kind of a formal music environment for the first time and he's digging it he loves it he's a music minor engineering major and when he was just a kid maybe about three four years of age in his bedroom i put in uh, an electronic keyboard and he would just da, 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 as a kid does then he put it on the audition or the yeah. demo version mm -hmm. and then he mimicked Wow. The keystrokes. Mm -hmm. He would come downstairs, and we have a, a grand down, baby grand downstairs. He would come downstairs, sit down, and mimic what he did on the demo in his room. This kid was playing absolute standalone music mm -hmm. at about four or five years of age. It, what side of the family does that come from? Like that creative gene? It would definitely be from his mom. Thank the Lord, most everything comes yeah. from the mom's side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he, he's wildly talented. Mm -hmm. And now it's culminated. He's only had about two lessons. Uh, the rest is all self-taught. He's just astounding. He did a rendition in sixth grade of Mozart's Turkish March that was a blockbuster. It went from there. Um, but now he loves local music. He's writing his own music. Mm -hmm. He has about 30 songs that he's put together, but he plays everything. He's a flautist, ukulele, piano, guitar, just virtually anything that he picks up. And music is his soul. He's, we have great conversations. What do you guys bond over? Bob Marley, absolutely. We will listen to Marley together, and both of us are just through the roof. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. But it, it does. It covers everything. Mm -hmm. You know, he will sit down and do a rendition, whether it's, whether it's Mozart, Beethoven, uh, Brahms, any of the wonderful classics. Mm -hmm. And it's mesmerizing. He asked me two years ago for a Christmas present. I said, well, absolutely. What would you like, mm -hmm. son? I'd like the music library of Scott Joplin. And I said, really? And sure enough, he embraced it, loves it, and he incorporates these these disciplines mm -hmm. into his own music and it's I'm just blown away you put redemption song on when we're in the car together forget about it that's so sweet I love it and Zoe's taking it up too she was inspired by her brother so now she's a keyboarder she plays piano she's all about contemporary music she does a great job and and I, I'm very appreciative in all honesty it came out of competition because She's very competitive with her brother, which isn't dissimilar to a lot of siblings. But it translated into music. And so now she is playing at school and is asked to perform and, and all of that. Music is just this great connector uh, for so many in a lot of different ways. Your origin story mm -hmm. in relation to Hawaii, uh, where were you born and raised up? Born in Chicago, Illinois. And the reason why is before I was conceived, I was already a Chicago Cubs fan. <laughs> and that's what did it. <laughs> Cubs and Bears, baby. And, and that's we're really, done. yeah, that's, really I just, uh, there was a running bet in the office, <laughs> uh, how, how soon he would mention the Cubbies. <laughs> um, 
No, it's uh, yeah. you and an, another uh, friend and co-worker here, Jimmy DeGee, oh, our yeah. Chicago Cubbies, uh, diehards, uh, live and breathe. Yep. Um, I could open a vein and bleed blue for you right now. I mean, it wouldn't be a problem. It would be like different uh, Cubbies logos through the years, <laughs> yeah, the little platelets if you put it under a microscope. Yeah, it would be a pinstripe blood stain. So, so, so uh, how did how did uh, Chicago, like uh, your family, arrive in uh, Illinois, mm -hmm. and then the subsequent uh, pledge Arrival allegiance here. to the Cubs? You know? Yay! Background ethnically, I'm Japanese, Filipino, European. And that came about with my grandfather and my grandmother meeting in Chicago. He from the Philippines, she from Scotland. Oh. And the reason why is that my grandfather from the Philippines was fortunate to connect with a family who were Lutheran faith. And in Missouri, it's the Missouri <laughs> Synod, <laughs> at Concordia, <laughs> Missouri. There's, there's this cat, yeah. um, I'll, I'll call him the sailor, and he's from um, Kansas City, well no, he's not from Kansas City, Missouri, it mm -hmm. was uh, St. Joe. St. Joe, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, but we used to talk about that, it's like there are people who would say Missouri, but you know that there are people in that Midwest neighborhood, it's Missouri. It's like guys from Louisiana. It's not New Orleans no. or New Orleans. It's yeah. Nolans. 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 Yeah. And so same thing. There. That's another. Met this bartender <laughs> during I'm the French Quarter. A, I'm sensing a theme <laughs> emerging here. And this is so. why I edit oh, everything. No, 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 this is all staying in. Even the drinking of the water. I'm going to give a pitch to my friend's company, Hawaiian Volcanic. Oh. This is the best. This is the best water in the world. I'm, I love it. It's great. Grandfather came to uh, went to study at Concordia. Mm -hmm. His assignment uh, during his uh, studies was to uh, be stationed, if you will, assigned to Cook County Hospital in Chicago, and that's where he met my grandmother. And so they connected, and they became married, and they eventually moved back to the Philippines, and that's where uh, my mom mm -hmm. and her five sisters uh, were born. And on my father's side, uh, second generation Japanese uh, in Baguio. And the Hamada family in Baguio, they've done very well. They've had a great impact mm -hmm. uh, through business and other things. Um, and then my parents met. They moved back as a young couple, moved to the Midwest, Chicago, because you had family on both sides that were in the Midwest. And then, Dun, 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 dun. Hello, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> Good to see you. You, uh, you with the cigarettes. Come on over here. And I was born in Chicago, and that's how I was born and raised in the mm -hmm. Midwest. You were raised Lutheran. Raised also? Lutheran. Went to Lutheran school as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, grandfather had a remarkable impact uh, on me. Um, he was a wonderful man. Just so dynamic and loved the Lord and uh, and. He, he ran things pretty, pretty strict. By, by, the, by the book. Yeah, pretty good. When I was a kid, I loved Jesus Christ Superstar. It was so compelling. I had I, the, the original Brown mm -hmm. album. I think every household had that vinyl uh, record. Back in the yeah. day. And I was just mesmerized with it. And so one day I brought it over to Grandma and Grandpa's mm -hmm. house. And I put it on uh, their stereo, and I'm like listening. He comes out of his little office in the back. What are you listening to? What is that? What are you listening to? Take that off now. That is heresy. That and, and went on and just derided it, which of course made me want to listen to it even more. <laughs> but that's the kind of ship that he ran. I mean, he was a very devout, uh, a, a very classy gentleman. The Midwest was a great place to grow up. Uh, I ended up in a small town, Valparaiso, Indiana. And the reason why, my grandfather was part of the largest Lutheran university in the country, at Valparaiso University. So that's how most of the, uh, that side of the family gravitated mm -hmm. there. And my mom amongst, it's good stuff. What did your parents do while in Illinois? So they came over very young. Mm -hmm. uh, they divorced when I was about two. The only thing that I can recall is that mom 
worked at Sears Roebuck, a Chicago-based company. Mm -hmm. And that was one of her first jobs, then moving to Valparaiso to be close to her folks. The earliest memory I have is her working for the local newspaper as a reporter. This is back in the 1960s. I was born in 61, so I'm on the verge of being 59 already. And when I was, I remember very young going to the newspaper and the technology back then you know, it was linotype. You just, you had to put in the slugs and all of that and then the whole printing experience and all. And I remember being there as a kid. And I grew up with her working for the newspaper. Did it uh, compel you to want to become a reporter? Consciously, I probably not. Subconsciously, absolutely. Because at one point, my mom uh, had a friend who owned a radio station in our small town. I can go back to my great, great uncle on my grandmother's side because he was still with us when I was a kid and I had a chance to experience him. Even though I was very, very young, he made an incredible impression on me. And I've thought about the whole ancestry train track and all this and I went through the exercise and then I stopped at like that generation. I, I got nothing else. And I never reached out really to any other family. Can you tell me more? Interesting that we're talking about that. I think I might actually follow through on that. There's a, when you get to this age, and maybe it's just me, but I'm, you no longer really are thinking ahead career and all this. I'm thinking about legacy. Uh -huh. What am I going to be able to leave? What will my children be able to benefit from the most? And their heritage is number one. They were fortunate enough to, to know their grandparent on both sides well, more so on Berna's side because they're still with us. So I was very happy about that. But what about beyond that? So when we went to the Philippines as a family, 22 of us, and we had a chance to go to Baguio where my family is from, I was so happy that they were able to see where their roots really began. And, you know, the Hamada family, they, it, my grandfather was an amazing businessman, all the way from lumber to publishing. And we still have a newspaper in the family and a publishing house. But through the years, we have schools that are named after members of our family. We have parcels of land that development has, et cetera, that we were responsible for. And I was very happy that my kids, Zach and Zoe, were able to see that. So they have a sense of place, as brief as it was, but we've revisited with the Hamada side of the family, which I was disconnected with for so, so very long. Um, and now we're back, and it's probably one of the best things that have really come about. So when we think about heritage and think about our past and contemporize it, it was, it's awesome, man. Back to the radio station, the yeah. radio station roots. Um, your mom, newspaper, journalist, mm -hmm. 1960s, yep. byline. Her name was uh, Dorothy Egan, E-A-G-E-N. Uh, the name of the paper was the Vidette, V-I-D-E-T-T-E, dash messenger was the name of the paper. The name of the radio station was W-N-W-I Radio, Valparaiso, so Indiana. Popularity. AM 1080. AM 1080. Yeah, see? Well, there we go. As a kid, I would go in with her. As a kid, I listened to Chicago music on WLS, the powerhouse of the day, uh, AM 89, which is now, ironically, a talk station. Uh, but I listened to, you know, contemporary music. Or what was contemporary? Um, the night Chicago died. Ba -ba -da -ba -da. That kind of stuff. And the guys were Larry Lujak and Bob Surratt and boys that I still, John Landecker, that made an impression on me to the point where I would mimic being a WLS radio guy in front of the mirror in my bedroom mm -hmm. with a hairbrush. And I would introduce songs. And I'm like six, seven, eight, nine, ten, around in that area. And that's, I loved it. And I, I was glued to radio. It was awesome.
Were there other radio stations, or was it like in the home, it was that one radio station and you never deviated from that? See how I... This that's, is that's, <laughs> that's exactly how it was back in the day. Really go, fine-tuning it. I'm yeah. going to go turn the knob <laughs> and the little line that moves. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was. But then I was down with 8-tracks. Well, what did you have yeah. um, in your library? Or was it your mom's library? Well, no, it was actually me. Mm -hmm. We did listen to a lot of music. I credit my mom for introducing me to my all-time number one vocalist, who is Lou Rawls. Did you see him in concert ever? I was blessed that when Lou came to Honolulu mm -hmm. under the first iteration of the Hawaii Pops with the mm -hmm. Symphony Pops, um, I was able to introduce him. Mr. Lou Rawls. Lou Rawls. It was a moment, I have pictures, and it, it just I'm beaming because that was the music that I loved when I was a kid and made the greatest impression and still does. You go in my car, mm -hmm. Lou Rawls Live, 1968. That album is just well, amazing. What happened? what happened then that it just kind of sat with you and continues to bring you happiness? I think it's album. because mom would listen to it quite a bit. And then he did the Budweiser with music, but oh, I remember that. He yeah, a lot of things nobody and you would listen to his voice, mm -hmm. and I was just it was incredible. But then, even then, the songs that I heard, the music itself, mm -hmm. it was it had jazz, it had blues, it had a little bit of rock, uh, it had some gospel, and the musicianship was fantastic. So I think that was, I really do think that was part of it. So back then we used to have like liner notes and you could mm. just take out all the information. Were you like, uh, did you read up about whoever engineered the album and produced it and the different players of the instrumentation? Were you like that much of a, a nerd about music? Or you're just like, no, 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 it's just, it's just Lou Rawls it's and everybody stuff. else is in his wake and they're just lucky to be <laughs> with him. Well, um, I did to a certain degree. Mm -hmm especially who wrote the music. And like uh, Gamble and Huff, two yes. remarkable talents. They were a, they played, a, they had a big presence and a lot. They actually did some Lou mm -hmm. production. So I would get into that. I, I was never an audiophile to where I got into the technical aspect of recording. Mm -hmm. Like for me to do radio today, Volume up, <laughs> volume down. Why isn't this working? It's not plugged in. Yeah. I, I, uh, <laughs> silly me. <laughs> I and, can't hear myself. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I have our engineers on speed dial. Yes. And they've changed their phone numbers me three to four times. <laughs> um, but but as a kid, I, but I listen to everything. Mm -hmm. I, one of my aunties, a country fan, and I would go over to her house and I'd play Kenny Rogers and just love Kenny Rogers and country music back in the day. My first exposure to theatrical radio mm -hmm. was War of the Worlds, the double album of the H.G. Wells and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was captured by it. I played it over and over and over and over again. And so when Halloween comes on my show, I'll always play little bits because it, w it was a big impact on me. Did so. you know that you were going to eventually work in radio, or was that a very intentional path for you? Because between being on AM 830 KHVH, mm -hmm. the news radio station here in Honolulu, um, and you've been on the air for, gosh, like 20 years? It's, uh, I'm on my way to 26. 26. I just made 25. Last See, I'm, year. I'm, uh, yeah. At my age, I'm, I'm just trying to like politely shave down, shave off. <laughs> Please. <laughs> because I'm, I'm aware, it's like that means I'm also included in that 26 years of being aware of Rick <laughs> Back in my day, get off my lawn. Yes, right. Approaching uh, 26 years. Um, before this yeah. proper one terrestrial station studio. Right. You were on the high seas. Yes, ma'am. Brief uh, career stint out of school in um, uh, data processing. 
My first real job was as a tech writer of computer operations for a bank in California. Wow, that sounds really exciting. Oh, yeah, I, I hope folks don't take a nap. <laughs> um, like, Tell me more about yeah, that. Please. <laughs> Woo! SOP manuals. <laughs> uh, and then I went to Citicorp, and then I had a midlife crisis. Midlife? Midlife crisis at about 24. That's about right. And I just went, I'm looking around, great job, BMW, great condo, great girlfriend, vacations two weeks a year, and all of this, and I'm at 24, I'm going, this is it? Am I done? Did I peak? Is this? Oh my gosh, can you imagine? I'm done. This is it. So this is me the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Couldn't handle that. While I was with Citicorp and et cetera, during the day, at night, I was doing local radio, mm -hmm. and I was DJing clubs. So uh, nightclubs, uh, dance clubs. And so when you say you were DJing, what, yeah. what uh, does that mean? I was spinning records of music to okay. people to dance to Did in you, a nightclub environment. Um, <laughs> when you were DJing, yeah. um, what, what's the time frame there? So that gets me to about 80, early 80s. Early 80s, 1980s. 84-ish. And what part of the country were you? California. In California. Yeah. Southern, northern? Bay Area. Bay Area. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember any of the, the names of the clubs or bars? Absolutely. <laughs> the first and foremost was Fat Fanny's. Phenomenal place. They had a couple of clubs, uh, kind of a, a food and, and a nightclub, uh, locally owned. Mm -hmm. In the 2000s through 2010s, there's like bedroom DJs. People are, you know, there's all these social apps where you mm. see by example, oh, Th on YouTube, somebody's DJing, and this is how to mix, and this right. is how you do all these things. Right. In the 1980s, unless you're already going out, there's no real inkling of like, oh, I could do that. You know, like there's Saturday Night Fever, you know, seeing people dancing at the nightclub, and yep. there's a DJ play this record. Um, how, how, did, how did all of your life take you to Fat Fanny's? I lied when I was 17 okay. to say that I was 21. And there was a little local bar restaurant in our town. And I went in mm -hmm. and I talked to the general manager or what have you. And I said, well, hey, listen, I, I've been here for dinner. I noticed you got a club back here and playing some music. And he was like, this is small town Midwest Indiana. Yeah. And this guy was like from Slovakia. And he's like, yes, as a matter of fact, we do play music here at night. Is this something that you can do? Or is this what you I said, well, actually, yeah, I would love to give it a try if you wouldn't mind. He goes, you bring in your own music. You come see me and you come in. So I went up and I started playing music. What the song was, Celebration, Cool in the Gang, was the hot song. So that puts us in kind of the year where we were. And I came in and played. He goes, oh, you sound good. You, you can work here a couple of nights a week, whatever nights you like to work. And I loved it. Absolutely loved it, and I was in high school. What was the setup? Was it just, were there two turntables, or did mm -hmm. you just play it all the way to the end? Click, you know, no. sleeve. Actually, had two turntables, uh, a little, back in the day, Radio Shack four-channel mixer. Okay. Had enough for the two turntables and a mic. Did you have to bring in your whole, your own cans, mm -hmm. your own headset? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And my own music. Orange crates were the best. Because they fit albums perfectly, mm -hmm. and they were sturdy. Oh, orange like the fruit, the, the citrus. Fruit. Oh, the I citrus, yeah, I the wooden. Like, <laughs> again, interesting. <laughs> I would put all my albums right here in this. This is amazing. No, but it was. You go, and ironically. That is amazing. I worked in a grocery store as a kid, yeah. so. But who was DJing in town that you would think to even do that? Nobody. You're just like, people need to get turned on to some more Lou Rawls. How can I? <laughs> I would play Lou Rawls. Slow songs. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I did lie about my age. and. Um, but that's the only lie you've ever uttered in your professional. Well, in this conversation. <laughs> so far. But no, and the guy was totally cool. That is. Do you remember his name? Oh, and gosh. do you remember, what was, what was the name of the joint that? Uh, the Glass Chimney. What a great name. Cool name. And it had the dining room, upscale dining for a small town. Mm -hmm. And then you would walk over and around, and there was the nightclub, mm. the bar, really. 
It wasn't big. I mean, maybe held about 50, 60 people or so. But there wasn't much in town. Oh, and then right down next door were the bowling lanes. I mean, if we're going to do this, let's have all the entertainment in one spot. Mm. And there was a little theater, music theater that was nearby. So, yeah, there, there, was some, there was some business. But anyway, I would just go in and play music. Two turntables, didn't know how to beat mix or anything. Didn't, nobody cared. That wasn't a just thing. Like, I know this song. I know that. Let's oh. get up and... Do you hey. take... Did you take requests? I did. Uh, my buddy who was in the service bar said, you need to put a jar out. A jar of what? <laughs> I was like, you need to put this. Someone asked for something, they can give you a tip. I said, oh, that's okay. I'm happy to do it. Mm -hmm. And then a guy came up, asked for a song, gave me a $5 bill. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, this is back in 1843 when I was just starting. <laughs> and I looked at him like, We didn't have bucks? pens back then to check. Is this a real $5 bill? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, wow. So I went over to my buddy. I said, you got a jar? <laughs> Can I get one of Can those fruit cocktail dishes? Something. Hey, give, me a, give me a stein. Give me a pilsner glass. That's wild. So how yeah. long were you at the glass chimney before you're like, I think Hollywood is, needs some of Rick Kamada. Did you go by Rick Kamada or that wasn't even a thing? It wasn't DJ Rick? No, it no. was, no. No, just went by my name. I just went by Rick. Rick. Because I figure, can I get in a lot of trouble if I get busted for being here illegally? <laughs> Um, I think that last, I can't recall exactly how long, several months, I don't know. I think th th at the heart of everything, it was music, mm. and, and I loved it. And here's just another way to do it. Um, so from Glass Chimney, mm -hmm. uh, how did that uh, get you to, or eventually, mm -hmm. that was that, and then your midlife crisis happened. It did. And then yeah. is that what called so, you, 17 21-year-old <laughs> Rick saying from your past saying, you remember how much fun you had working for tips? That's not a bad stretch mm -hmm. because even when moving to California and to start work mm -hmm. and it was with uh, a bank, Central Bank, I could never get away from radio. And I worked at a FM radio station the entire time I was there. What were the calls? KCRK FM. That Walnut sounds... Creek, California. I wonder if they're still up and running. I don't. I've or checked. maybe they probably changed formats. And what well, do you remember the your air shift and your name mm -hmm. and? No, I went by Rick Amata on the air. Um, You've never deviated from that. No, I, I even in clubs and what I, I could never do the, you know, Ricky D or you know whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the Rickster. Yeah. I went by Maryland once. I thought it was great. No. <laughs> but I, um, I loved doing it. I really did. So when I got to California, started the work, got in touch with KCRK. They had me come in. Mm -hmm. And I had not, aside from what I dabbled in with my mom's radio station when I was a kid, yeah. when uh, first year of school in the dorms, there was a radio station. But it was not a broadcast station. It was... Uh, campus, in, campus in, wide. It was no, it was only dorm wide. They had a very minimal transmitter, but you could you could hear it a little bit further out. Mm -hmm. But it, it and that's where I sat down in front of a microphone and played music in a radio setting. Did you model your delivery um, as your heroes back when you were a kid? Or you probably wouldn't even realize like yeah. your delivery unless you had tapes. Do you have tapes? No. You're lying to me. <laughs> no, I. I'm like, do you have reel to reels? <laughs> I, I don't. I oh. kind of wish I did. That'd be great if you had a picture of like when you were at the glass chimney. I think that would just be amazing. I don't think I ever did. In all seriousness, but part of it was because I was underage. I wasn't supposed to be there. I, I love your the, your um, your body's. Um, tone is kind of like you feel really bad that you lied about it. I, well, yeah, because I, did, I didn't know at the time what those implications really were. Mm. Drago, I, I can't recall the, the guy's name, he was totally cool. The one moment, this is a men's room story, so hide the children. We're in the men's room, and he's, oh, hey, we're going to have a good night tonight. Oh, he was a very slick dude. I said, yeah, but it's a tough day. He goes, well, tell me, what, what happened? Bob Marley died today. Oh. 
And he went ashen because that was his guy, mm -hmm. Bob Marley. And I thought he knew. And as soon as I told him, he was just, he was distraught. He was weeping. He went in the men's room with this going on. And I think I bring that up only to show what kind of a guy he was. He was a very cool guy. If I had been busted and he brought me in to work as underage, he would have suffered. Mm -hmm. And putting people in that kind of jeopardy, yes. I didn't realize what the implications were. Obviously, I do now. Mm -hmm. And I, felt ba I feel bad about it because I was, I was selfish. It was all about me. I want to do this. I want to do that. And I didn't consider what the reality is mm -hmm. of what I was doing. So I try and behave now. That's great. That story kind of fills in the blanks as to when I hear you on your talk format, mm -hmm. your morning program with Scotty B, that um, the way you will listen to callers and how you interact with, to me, if there's like a challenging um, debate going on, mm -hmm. you're very fair to me. And it, when it gets to a point where it's... Um, they're getting extra yeah. then you know you you're very gracious when you you wrap it up you know mm -hmm. but you never allow your i don't know it's just, it's like there's not ego when you're doing it mm -hmm. you know it's just you're very mindful of the um the general manager of uh, glass of chimney glass chimney in the bathroom who's always who's always on the phone and in yeah. your studio interesting thank you for that um Listen, the, the way I look at it is that I'm blessed to have a job. I'm like anybody else. Mm -hmm. I live the same life as the majority of people in this town. I'm a parent like a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I've got bills. I've got to take care of business. I've got to make sure that we're thriving, not just surviving. I need to do... The only difference is I have a microphone. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. And when I say give us a call, 521-8383, I look at it like I'm inviting people to come over. Hey, yeah. come on in. Have a seat, something to drink, uh, you, you good? And I would never disrespect anybody that I invited over to my house. Mm -hmm. So when I invite people to call in, come on in and join me. Come on in, let's have a chat. I might be internally thinking that you're a complete, utter, absolute moron, and I disagree with you a thousand percent, <laughs> but I'm not, that's not what I yeah. do in public. Yeah. But I have my moments, and I've, there was, I went through this thing, at Kathy, I don't know what it was, but for a while, I was being really rough on callers. Mm -hmm. And to the point where even my producer at the time said, are you okay? Yeah. And I had to stop and really check myself. And a lot of other stuff going on that, that was affecting that. And so I remember at one point I went on the air and I spent 10 minutes apologizing. And I meant it. I said, I want to apologize. I, 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 I uh, yeah. I honestly don't know why, but mm -hmm. I did, and I want to say I'm sorry because that's not that's not what we do here. Yeah. And I had more callers expressing about the apology mm -hmm. than some of the topics that we bring up, and I don't think a lot of folks in media do that. And in other words, what I mean is just being transparent, mm -hmm. just being genuine, man. It's not an act. I know there are some shows and some hosts in, in my format, oh, they're brutal. Mm -hmm. And that's what the belief is to their success. And if it works for them, it works for them. Great. It's just not me. And I'm not... Politics can divide immediately. Mm -hmm. If I mention you right now, Donald Trump. He's tall. He's tall. He wears a, <laughs> he wears a nice red tie. He wears ties. Yeah. But if you were to just in conversation, it, yeah. it can elicit various reactions. Yeah. Whomever it is. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing, a lot of people assume that I'm a Republican because mm -hmm. I'm more of a conservative in my opinions. Mm -hmm. And I'm not. I've never been. I don't belong to any party. I don't want to. I want to be independent. I want to think for myself. I want to choose not be beholden mm -hmm. to an organization and then be judged, criticized, or whatever because of what I say or do. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to be myself and say, that guy over there, that lady over there, uh, you're good. I like you guys. Yeah. I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican or independent. I do care if you're a socialist communist. <laughs> so, 
Oh, Where's my rations? <laughs> That, when you talked about, um, when you just said about how politics can divide or mm -hmm. does divide, it just dawned on me that uh, why, why does it have to be that way? Or just for anything, there's mm -hmm. always like teams, like Team BTS or Team Monster X. Yeah. Talking K pop bands, kids. <laughs> um, yeah, there are times where it's the last thing I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. So, the reason why it's uh, a big part of the program and with me is that my mantra is whether we like it or not politics touches every part of our lives mm -hmm. every day from the moment you wake up and you turn on your water to get a drink of water or something there's a political impact made on the cost of the water that you're pouring if you go to the refrigerator open the door the light comes on your electric rates there is some sort of governance and regulatory issue mm -hmm. Get in your car, put on your clothes. There's everything that we do, there's an implication. So I don't assign political party to what I do. I assign common sense. What well, makes sense? Mm -hmm. Does it make sense to overspend? Does it make sense to continually take money from others and give to others in some various ways? Does it make sense that a centralized government should make all the decisions for you, and in order to do those decisions, they have to take? A majority or mm -hmm. a great deal of your revenue for your f should have for yourself and say well we have to take care of housing we have to take care of homelessness we have to take care of really because I don't view it that way I'm a big guy that says private sector we take care of our own business let us free free us up don't regulate us don't squelch us mm -hmm. allow us to use part-time talent treasure to accomplish what we need to do and I bristle when we're told that, no, you, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. See, you're not helping the general public. You're not helping the guy over there. You're not. Mm -hmm. say, well, I will if I have more to use to do the things that I believe yeah. are important. So the political side is because of the great daily impact. And I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, black, white, yellow, purple, brown. If you're doing something dumb, mm -hmm. doing something logical, doing something damaging, then there's got to be some consequence. Unfortunately, we don't have that here at home mm -hmm. because we don't vote. <laughs> Call now. <Okay. laughs> I'm just saying. It's well, the nice balance is what you're able to... Um, when you highlight on your morning program, it's not narrow. It's you mm -hmm. kind of open that spotlight, so it's just like everybody bring your opinion if you disagree or if you have a question, because I might not have considered that. Because it's just about like shifting a degree, and it's like, oh, that's that other degree here that yeah. I what, I didn't see. Uh, nice balance that you have with that is you also host our Community Matters, mm -hmm. and how long have you been doing Community Matters? And explain yeah. what Community Matters sure. is. Uh, we are required by SEC to provide X amount of time for public service programming. Mm -hmm. Public service programming is to inform and educate the general public on mm -hmm. issues that are important to all of us. So originally, we were mandated to do a 60-minute public service program per week. Mm -hmm. and. This came down when we were very young. Uh, Linda Koble mm. uh, and I started this program. She was with KSSK mm -hmm. at the time. I was KHVH, and we came up with the idea of community. We needed we need a name of a show. And I said, "Well, it matters of what we're doing." She goes, "Community matters." I go, "Community matters," and that's community matters. So it was Linda Koble and I mm -hmm. back in ninety five. Mm -hmm. I started in 94, soon after I, I officially started. When she was with KSSK, uh, she was with the news department. Mm -hmm. Was she the news director mm -hmm. then? Yep. She was news, um, and she was on with uh, Mike and Larry in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, but she was also assigned this. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we got together, the interesting part, and by the way, absolutely love Linda, still to this day. My heart aches for Kirk. Um, Kirk and Bernadette, 
uh, work Matthews, together. Kirk Matthews. Kirk Matthews, uh, Linda's husband, uh, worked together um, as co-anchors of the morning show on KHON years and years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, and so we became very close. And when Linda and I first started out, we had differing opinions on life <laughs> and what <laughs> matters in our community. Yeah. And so we would have guests on, and there were times where Linda and I just... Oh, we were co-hosting it. We were co-hosting. Okay. And we would have our moments of disagreement. And it would turn into, well, and we would have our own sidebar debate and then bring mm -hmm. in... Anyhow, bottom line is, we started that. Linda had moved on. Mm -hmm. And then I just started doing the program on my own. Mm -hmm. About five years ago or so, we discovered 60 minutes wasn't required. It was only 30. And so we brought it down to a 30-minute segment. But it does air on all of our stations mm -hmm. Sundays. But the Community Matters, it's a public service, so the focus is on the guest. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be on the host. And I try my very best not to ingratiate myself. You don't have a producer for it. It's, it's you and, may, and maybe an engineer that no. you're, you, you engineer the program. I so just, there's no, yeah. no one who's like, hi, before you talk to Rick, and they do mm. a Q&A about like, different mm. topics to, nope. It's uh, just like, hey, they're here. OK, we're yeah. going to record. I get a one sheet of some information. Yeah. Um, occasionally, one of, if, if the guest is um, also a client, then an AE will, will do, mm -hmm. they'll be helpful, no doubt about it. But 90% of the time, I'm on the phone or I'm emailing, come mm -hmm. on in and this, and I'll just go for it. And it's, I think after decades, uh, it's the institutional knowledge mm -hmm. that you gain and glean and are able to use. It's been so very helpful. You really enjoy your life. Mm -hmm. A lot of challenges. We were very poor when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, we uh, we had government assistance for a period of time. Um, I was confronted by a potential molester when I was uh, a 10, 11 mm. neighbor next door. Uh, parents divorced. I've had three stepdads. Not an indictment on my mom, but it was a very kind of a turbulent mm -hmm. growing up. I have a half sister, Stacy. Um, we weren't particularly close. Then we became close, and then we became distant again mm -hmm. for whatever reason. After my mom passed, mom passed. Uh, be eleven years this July fourth. So when your parents yeah. divorced, when you were about two, about two, you stayed on with your mom. Yes. Did you ever? Uh, continue contact with your father? No. No. And it was a visit by my aunties to help with the estate of my grandmother who had passed where they connected with the Hamada family. Mm. And based on that meeting, um, there was an invitation for me to reconnect. And a majority of the family were in the east, New Jersey, New York. Oh, and interesting. They yeah. invited me to come out. I was, this was right about glass chimney time because I was reading GQ magazine. Um, <laughs> I, was about, I was about 16, 17. And they flew me out, and I had a chance to meet wondrous people, mm -hmm. just professionals, mostly medical. My auntie and uncle uh, owned two convalescent hospitals oh, that's so in New cool. Jersey, yeah. and most of the family worked within. Knock on the door, opens the door, uh, and there's there's a guy at the door. And he's got on like a biker vest and shredded jeans and a t-shirt mm -hmm. with holding a bandana, shades, smoking a cigarette. And uh, my uncle comes up and says, "Rick, come on over. I'd like you to meet your father." And I literally laughed. <laughs> <laughs> I went, ha, ha, ha. "Really?" And it was a, that was a, su such a surprise, and and he was so different from his siblings and cousins and all that. And he said, "Let's go. Um, come on, I'll take you over to, to my house." What was his okay. first name? Samuel. Did you address him as? Did you even 
address him as anything during that visit? Do you remember? Uh, I did. His nickname was Apollo. And that's what I called him. I didn't call him dad. Yeah. Didn't feel it, didn't sense it. And I think some of it is because you grow up with um, your independence. Whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. Mom never denied, never prevented, never what have you, mm -hmm. but it, we had our own lives. We had our own family, and, and so mm -hmm. just moved along. But I did ask her, I said, I got the invitation. I asked her, is it okay if I go? Because I wanted her permission. Also, when Bert and I got married, I wanted her permission to um, be confirmed as a Catholic to leave the Lutheran and confirm with Catholicism. That must have been tough. It was for me because I had to weigh it out. I have my lineage and my history, but I'm creating a family, and mm -hmm. I wanted our family to be under one faith. It was important to me, especially for the kids. And, but in the back of my head, as I shared about my adoration for my grandfather, yeah. I felt like I was, I didn't want to betray. I didn't, you know. Not to, to be disrespectful at exactly, all. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It was really important. So I reached out to mom. And I said, listen, this is what I'm thinking, and uh, I, I'm reticent, but I think it's in the best for my future family. That, and she said, absolutely, hmm. absolutely. And then it got back into really what the fundamentals are of faith. It's not just like political parties. It's not necessarily a denomination. Mm -hmm. It's not this, it's the relationship. Yeah. And so that has never been compromised, whether I'm identified as a mm -hmm. Lutheran or a Catholic. Um, there are belief systems that I subscribe to. There are some that I'm not a fan of. Mm -hmm. But um, it was important to be under that one faith. Mm -hmm. And the kids grew up Catholic and they attended Catholic schools. And, and I think that was, a, that was a meaningful decision. Were you uh, only cakey with your mom? Uh, sister okay. with a different dad. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Dorothy, when um, you were growing up with her, was it hard for you to leave her side and strike out on your own? I'm assuming you were mama's um, boy as, you know. 100%, 1,000%. <laughs> yeah. uh, but she had remarried mm -hmm. and to a good man. Mm -hmm. And by the time I had left, they were together, and so I felt pretty good about it. However, call every day. Up until she passed, wow. we would talk. What was it like um, as she got to know you as a husband, mm -hmm. as a father, yeah. and then even with the kids, what was that relationship like? What was it like for you as a son to see your mom like that? And we have always uh, been so incredibly close. Mm -hmm. uh, it's when we flew back home when Zach was born. That was the moment. When I was able to present my son. To love your parent, and then as you get older, you know, it's like you don't become friends with them. They're always going to be your, mm -hmm. your mom or dad, if you're lucky, or the mother and the father, if that's what the relationship is. but to be able to grow with them mm -hmm. and for them to also transition. I think that's a really healthy, it's a healthy yeah. way to live. But there's no books and instructions about how to do that. It's like everybody, every human being is having to figure it out every day. That's right. You know, so it, I'm, I'm so glad that that's what happened for you and your mom. It was mom. astounding. Yeah. You're so proud of her, and she's so proud of well, you. And, I, I you know, it's to be great. honest with you, the other thing I was being, being honest with her, it was I got to the point where I understood what she mm. had to endure in order to bring my sister and myself to where we are today. Mm. I think that um, if there's the, any qualities that I can bring, or if there's any contributions that I make, or if there's any. Um, positivity mm -hmm. that is um, advanced, it's because of her. Period.